Hello, everyone, and good evening, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Matt Alagai. I'm the editor-in-chief of It's Nice That, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to this, the very first Nicer Tuesdays online of 2021. First off, I just wanted to say a massive thank you to all of you for signing up for today's event. It's going to be a very special one, as uh, we're relaunching this year with a brand new format. Nicer Tuesdays online will still be held monthly on the last Tuesday of the month. That will stay the same. What's different, though, is that this year, each event is going to have its own theme. And instead of four speakers, we're going to be joined by just two, but we'll be talking to them in more depth, discussing their work and the issues raised by it, and giving you folks at home more of a chance to ask your own questions. Tonight's event has a very timely theme, creative responses to crisis. Don't worry, though, this isn't going to be all about the pandemic. I feel like we've all heard enough about that. Instead, we want to look at how artists and designers have grappled with immense global challenges in their work, everything from conflict to climate change. Thanks very much for bearing with me. It's now time to meet our first guest. Palomi Basu is a transmedia artist, photographer, and activist. Her book, Centralia, which came out last year, journeys deep into the forests of central India to uncover a little known and underreported conflict that has been simmering for years between an indigenous tribal people and the Indian state. Palomi describes the work as a docufiction, partly because it recognizes that in war, truth is the first casualty. And Centralia is always looking to explore that unsteady relationship between reality and fiction. The series won a National Geographic Explorer Award and has been shortlisted for the 2021 Deutsche Börse uh, Foundation Photography Prize. I'm de delighted to say that Palomi joins me now uh, from Goa. Palomi, if you could turn your audio and video on, that would be, that'd be great. Hi, hello, Matt. Hi there, Good welcome to uh, Nicer Tuesdays. <laughs> Very happy to be here from Goa. <laughs> yeah, all the way from Goa. So you managed to escape London about 10 days ago, I hear. <laughs> I did, I did. I mean, it was a brave feat to take a long flight and then quarantine for a few days and get like tested thrice, but I'm happy I'm here. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us, especially considering it's, it's past midnight in Goa. Um, we're going to start kind of before we get down to speaking to you and discussing your work, we're going to start by playing a short film. Um, that you've made for us this evening. It's something between a kind of a talk and a performance, if I can put it that way. Um, I'm sure the audience will understand in a second what, what I mean by that. Um, I should also say to those of you watching at home, there are definitely some images here that uh, you may find shocking or upsetting, just to, just, just to warn you. Um, we'll be back to discuss Centralia in around nine minutes. Um, and again, just a reminder to everyone, as you're watching, if you do have any questions for Palomi that pop into your head, please drop them in the chat and we'll do our best to get to them afterwards. Um, okay, let's start by watching the film. While protest reverberates on the streets of Chile, Catalonia, Britain, France, Iraq, Lebanon and Hong Kong, and a new generation rages against what has been done to their planet, I hope you will forgive me for speaking about a place where the street has been taken over by something quite different. There was a time when dissent was India's best export. But now, even as protest swells in the West, our great anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist movements for social and environmental justice, the marches against big dams, against the privatization and plunder of our forests, our rivers, against mass displacement and the alienation of indigenous peoples' homelands, have largely fallen silent. On September 17th last year, Prime Minister Narendra Modi gifted himself the fill to the brim reservoir of Sarvada Sarovar Dam on the Narmada River for his 69th birthday, while thousands of villagers who had fought that dam for more than 30 years watched their homes disappear under the rising water. It was a moment of great symbolism. Accordingly, Centralia is a tale of fractured landscape in extremis. It is a portrait of contemporary India a twisted spin on classical documentary photography that draws attention to a multi-layered conflict in which everyone seems to lose. Between the shifting planes of reality, this is an India of the mind, a place both hyperreal and metaphorical, familiar yet alien. Dazzled by an apocalyptic beauty, by eclipse and fire, by joy, dread and dream, by life and death, Centralia is a passage deep into the forests of central India, where a little-known and underreported conflict between a Maoist guerrilla army and the Indian state slowly simmers. 
Military encounters are faked and former insurgents wear the uniform of the police. Massacres are brutal and reprisals are swift. Within this labyrinthine conflict, the people of this mineral-rich land are transfixed. To give you just one example, on 13th of June 2016, Magdam Hidme was dragged away by security personnel who had just raided her village. The next day, police sent back her body, a stark nude body wrapped in plastic. According to the account of her mother, the body was mutilated with her wrist and teeth broken and she had been raped. Later, the police would release a photo of Hidme. Her lifeless body sprawled across the ground wearing the uniform of a Maoist guerrilla fighter. Accordingly, the police, there was just another outlawed fighter killed as they carried out raid to rid the area of illegal combatants, bringing instability to this mineral-rich area. To the Adivasis, the tribal people, she was another victim of a merciless assault on their rights as the Indian state attempts to dismantle its own constitution and deny the rights of the indigenous people. As the Indian writer and activist Arundhati Roy has noted, the Indian government has turned the entire tribal population into squatters on their own land. It has criminalized a whole way of life. In exchange for their right to vote, it snatched away the life, their right to livelihood and dignity. My hybrid methodology is true specificity and is deliberately disjointed, stripping images of tried visual cues that often simplify a complex geopolitical realities. Centralia explores the unsteady relationship between reality and fiction and how our perception of reality and truth are manipulated. Centralia also tells the several tales of women, what they do when pushed to extreme situations and how they challenge their own roles in the society, especially rural women who are rising up against the state. Seeking to liberate images from the oppression of specificity, gazing beyond the jungle book and associating this invisible conflict with the wider issues of environmental degradation, this exploitation comes at a price, the transmogrification of violence into the de facto language of politics. Freedom is shrinking and what we say and who we are is being obscured. In the face of this rampant excavation of this environmental disaster, the individual is crushed, their identity erased and denied. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Palomi. Um, yeah, an incredibly, incredibly powerful film. Um, I guess to start with, just a question really, we're here talking this evening about creative responses to crisis. Um, for you, what was the first spur to start creating this series? What was it that caused you to think, you know, I need to tell this story? Well, you know, I've always been sort of interested in stories that are, I mean, I mean I've mean, i been interested in sort of telling stories from the hinterlands and parts of discovering my own country in a way that, you know, it's less known to the world or what it's like most people living within the country are unaware of, you know. But I was also interested in sort of representing, showing, telling stories about people who find themselves caught, ordinary people who find themselves caught in these extraordinary situations and also tell sort of stories, intersectional stories of, you know, climate change, environmental justice and women's rights. And, you know, Centralia is sort of sits at the heart of all these three issues, yeah. And it's something that really um, struck me and it's something that you talk about in that, in that film is the phrase, the oppression of specificity, which I just, I've never heard before. And I'm fascinated by it. Um, it's kind of talking about wanting to remove the specificity from your images. Um, could you just talk to us a little bit about that and um, yeah, what you mean by the, the oppression of specificity? I think when you put captions and words on images, sometimes you the image doesn't transcend itself beyond what it's meant to. So I feel like, you know, a lot of some pictures, they should they should be suspended in time, you know, and not just 
belong to a specific space in a specific time, especially in uh, stories that you're trying to in trying to tell stories about in which you're sort of trying to present different versions of truth and a collision of perspectives to tell that story. You know, that's what I really that's that's what I really meant when I was trying to tell that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, you've also spoken there about so another phrase that always uh, that really grabbed me was. Um, wanting to remove the the visual cues that often simplify complex geopolitical realities. Um, I'm really interested in those those visual cues that you talk about. What what's a kind of an example maybe of, of a visual cue that that oversimplifies a, a situation like the situation in, in Centralia? Um, I think one of the one of the story uh, one of the pictures of uh, Magdam Hidme in which you see her sort of dead body lying, you know, with the with a fake uniform of uh, an insurgent's uniform on a tribal woman and then declaring her as a guerrilla fighter, you know? So by sort of telling that story, but removing it, it from its con context, context in a way that when you see it, you don't, you can't tell what is happening. When you look at the picture, you think it's a guerrilla that is, that is lying with a gun. But what is happening is that every single thing within that picture has been recreated and reframed to sort of tell you a version of truth that's being presented to you, you know? So that's what I tried to mend by removing visual cues, but at the same time, you know, offering those multiple perspectives of the same situation to sort of interrogate well, as an audience, you are interrogating what is happening rather than, you know, what is being presented to you as what you see. Mm -hmm. I, I guess, I mean, what the kind of leads me on to the next question, which is all about that relationship between what you're doing, um, you know, as an artist and photographer and what you might kind of traditionally call conflict photography or, or war photography, which is probably too kind of, yeah, simple, simple a term. But um, I guess, yeah, what, what do you describe that relationship as? I, I know that you've, you know, done, you've sat on panels alongside Lindsay Adario and people like that who are obviously very, um, very famous, yeah, war photographers. Do you feel like there's a difference though between what you're doing and, and what Lindsay yeah. Daria is doing? <laughs> I think there's a huge difference between me and Lindsay's, Lindsay's and my work because she's a full-blown photojournalist, whereas I don't think. I do use journalism and, as a research tool, but I don't call, call myself a photojournalist. I think I use, I'm somebody who uses variety of approaches to tell a story, you know? So I, I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't believe in this sort of, I don't like to put myself in, into boxes while trying to tell stories, whereas Lindsay is very much a photojournalist and an amazing one. And I think for me, I can't, I can't do justice to a complex situation by presenting 30 pictures and saying, this is the truth of the situation and this is what is being presented to you in these words, in these three lines of caption. I've always struggled to do that because I've always, I've been always interested in looking at gray areas in a situation and try to tell sort of nuanced stories rather than stories that show you black and white within the space. And especially in complex situations, in complex conflicts, I've always felt that there has to be an alternate way of telling stories rather than a straight, say 15 to 30 picture S photo essay or how photojournalism usually does. So I think I'm a very different kind of practitioner from Lindsay, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, I guess it, it comes back to that that word docufiction, maybe just as a last question, because I know it's incredibly late there now, but um, that word docufiction or that portmanteau docufiction that you've, you've used to describe your work, I mean, it's almost, you know, it's two different, very different opposites um, kind of words, but you, you kind of put them together. And I guess, what does that, what does that genre mean to you? Is it, is it a difference? Yeah, I guess a difference from documentary think, and a difference from fiction. I think throughout Centralia, I think a lot of the pictures, you don't know whether what, what you're seeing is truth or if it's a lie. So I think you're constantly sort of running in, on this territory where you don't know what you're witnessing is is an actual situation or whether it has been staged, you know? So I think that's where the work sort of treads this sort of thin line between documentary and fiction, because the truth is the first, as I said, was is the first casualty in any war, in, in any war, and especially in a, in a conflict like Chhattisgarh, you know, where multiple actors are, have multiple roles and they're like shadows moving across the forests, you know? So it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how everybody is trying to tell you their version of the story and 
you don't know who's lying or who's telling you the truth. You don't know what's re recreated or what is staged or what is a real situation, you know? So there's always this interplay between reality and fiction and, you know, it's up to you what you make of it, you know? Fantastic. Well, Palomi, um, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, but thank you so, so much for, uh, you, for joining you. us this evening and so late from, from Goa as well. <laughs> thank <laughs> um, you. Really appreciate it.